I'd give anything to have your life, period. What's the secret to living a full and happy life? The kids go to school. We asked 1,000 people across the country what makes them happy. Okay. Tell me when to go. Yep, okay, we're so, good. So again, okay. And for one year, we followed five families in two very different American cities. Worlds apart in geography and lifestyle, we discovered something. Say your name nice and loud. Or no, you can... Despite their differences, they share the same life-changing keys to happiness. Don't assume that money makes you happy. Our research found it comes down to four things. People with strong ties to family, faith, work, and community involvement are the most likely to be very happy in life. Happiness in these surveys is just defined by how people sort of rate themselves. The poor are disconnected from these four long-standing pillars of any American community. We've all heard that money does not buy happiness. But the divide between the well-off and the poor is growing and creating an entire segment of society filled with despair. Painted black or painted white, call it whatever you think defines, but we only see. My name is Stephen Michael Elder, and I work for the Catholic Charities of Northern Nevada. Here we go. Uh, I help feed the homeless, and I take care of janitorial work. For a long time, I lived by myself. And I used to always tell myself, yeah, I, I don't mind. You know, I don't care. But at the same time, I was so lonely, it's pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> I always kept telling people I'm content, but I'm not happy. You never really felt that alone to me. You never really felt that alone. I think when I hear the American dream, I think of financial stability. My 10-year goal when I graduated high school it was to have a thriving career. My perspective has changed significantly. That's it, baby. <laughs> yeah, so I guess if I could describe my wife, super hot. <laughs> he is the most hardworking man. I mean, he loves his family. He puts, you know, family first for sure. Did you put butter on the table? No. Daddy's favorite macaroni. See how it goes, Daddy. I am 37 years old, and right now I work currently at a place called Dapper Donuts. I'm a decorator, a dapper decorator. Yeah, I feel pretty good about it. I have four children, all girls, aging from 19 on down to six, and this is the six-year-old right here. And I am single. I'm Nathan Dodd. I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I am 40 years old. No high school diploma, got my GED. I detail cars for a living, but I'm currently un unemployed. Uh, I've got a four-year-old little daughter. Found out she was mine two and a half years ago, got custody. So I'm Brad Wilcox. I'm a professor of sociology here at the University of Virginia, and I'm also the director of the National Marriage Project. Dr. Brad Wilcox is one of the nation's leading experts on family life, religion, work and volunteering. We're definitely in a bubble. I don't think upper middle class Americans have much appreciation for what working class and poor Americans' lives look like. His new research reveals a growing divide between those who experience a happier life and those who don't. What we're seeing is that Americans who are, who are better educated, Americans who are more affluent, are more likely to rate themselves you know, very happy on a 10-point scale. <laughs> 
As income increases, a divide in happiness grows between the lower third and everyone else. But that doesn't mean money is the fix. I know plenty of people who have a lot of means and they are very miserable. Julie Baumgartner began her career in social work and counseling and runs a nonprofit organization in Chattanooga, Tennessee. First Things First works to keep families intact, which in turn makes the community stronger. There's a lot of people out there who've struggled through a lot of stuff. school diploma, but he does have a full-time job. I love to work because I'm doing something productive for myself. I'm staying out of jail. Hard work and trying to get ahead in life have always been part of the American story. Previous generations embraced this idea, regardless of their education level. And that's just chocolate sauce with sprinkles. I decorate donuts. I help uh, package them. I make boxes up clean, greet the customers. I'm happy that I'm healthy enough and I'm able to get out there and go to work. Chandra works part-time when she can, but being on her own makes it much harder to be there for her kids. Nobody had my kids, nobody said, hey, go have these kids and take care of them on your own. I never thought I would be alone taking care of four kids, you know, but it happened. Jason made this when he was in uh, kindergarten. Frank worked at DuPont yeah, swing shifts, and I'd done a lot with the boys. My dad has always been a hard worker. I think it was 1985, he lost his job uh, at DuPont through the recession, and it was very tough on our family. Really thought everything was okay. I mean, yeah, I had everything planned, it was gonna be fine, you know. And then all of a sudden I'm laid off without a job. I come here after my dad lost his job. You know, being a nine or 10 year old kid, that was hard to see. And um, I had that burden on me, you know. The economy's great and I'm slammed every week. Uh, so I'm super busy, which is wonderful. Very blessed. Hey guys, this is a brand new construction. It was always a real sense of, you need to work, and he would back that up with scripture. My wife sometimes has to say, hey, you know, you need to chill out a little bit, you need to spend a little more time with us. Cross streets are East 19th Street and East 21st Street at Highlands Apartments. We'll take care of it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Part of the reason I guess I did get into the job, I want to be able to help people one of the best feelings I get each day when my kids give me a hug when I come home. I see their faces smiling and they're excited to see me and I can just, you know, take my police clothes off and be dad. While full-time work used to be something pursued by all social classes, there's been a big drop in employment among non-college educated men. What we have seen in the last 50 years is that fewer and fewer men are in the labor force, particularly men who don't have high school degrees. That matters because of course they have less income or no income and they're more likely to be depressed, hopeless about their own situation. I say my family when they basically 
turned on me, thinking I'm just lazy, don't want to do nothing. That was hard on me. When it comes to family, marriage is linked to more happiness. This survey found 80% of married people are very happy. Upper middle class Americans are not only more likely to get married, but they're more likely to, to stay married. And it's not because their marriages are that much better than everyone else's. I think it's because there's been a kind of a recognition at some level that their welfare, their well-being, and welfare and well-being of their children is connected to their ability to, to get through difficult times together. There are definitely times in marriage where satisfaction decreases significantly, where people can find themselves in a rut. We're just doing the same old, same old. It's boring. I'm tired. You're tired. What are we doing? You can go through the motions and you can survive in a relationship, but I'm tired of survival mode. I've used the word divorce before um, when I shouldn't have. And um, in my mind, we aren't going to divorce. I love him and, and not in a way that I need him to complete me. He does bring value to my life, even though he brings struggles too. I just remember her walking through the back of the church and I had never seen somebody so beautiful in all my life. I now pronounce you husband and wife and you make this prayer. It was really cool because my dad is a minister and he uh, officiated the ceremony. Kids later and with thriving careers, the Wrights look like another perfect, college-educated, middle-class family. But infidelity put their marriage in crisis. I lived one life there, and I lived a different life at home. My husband was at work. He didn't know. I thought I was going to get out of the first affair because of my guilty conscience, but really ended up being into a second affair. I got out of the second one because a third person approached me. It was just overwhelming, and I was already too deep. I couldn't get out. I was just so tired of living in darkness. Like, I just felt so dark and sad. I thought, well, even if this leads to divorce, I promise you, Lord, that I would tell him, and I'll tell him. And so I told him. I wound up so tight. Day to I remember knowing that in the Christian faith, that God, that's his one out for divorce, is infidelity, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Faith was certainly key for Jason and Shannon, but so was the support of extended family. I just thank the Lord for Jason's parents being there that night. She came right here and sat at our table and told us how sorry she was. She started crying. I just looked at her and I said, Shannon, I just can't believe that of you. I said, it's totally shocked me. I said, but I forgive you because you are the mother of our grandchildren. I would look at my children and I would think, I don't want to spend the rest of the life them living out of a suitcase between mom and dad's house. You see people with a college education and jobs significantly less likely to divorce. About 80% of people who live in neighborhoods like this are married, compared to just 30% of people in low-income neighborhoods. My suspicion here in looking at upper middle class trends is that they are kind of responding to difficult situations by working through them. I think by contrast, working class Americans are more likely to respond to the same kinds of difficult situations by saying, you know what, that's it, we're done. Just like Nathan in Chattanooga, Chandra is a single parent getting help from extended family 
and anywhere she can find it. She's had four kids with four fathers and has never been married. I'm trying to get sole custody of my kids. I don't really want their money. I would just like them to stay completely out of my kids' lives because they don't help me anyways. When I moved in, it was 625, and now it's like 675. We have spiders back here. There's field mice that come in our house, and they don't exterminate for mice. So we're putting these, like, these little sticky traps down, and we're all like standing on couches screaming when we see mice because we're scared, we're petrified of them. Chandra's chronic family instability has forced her to rely on the community to keep her family together. She turned to Northern Nevada Hopes in Reno, a community health center that also helps with housing. It's just me with four kids, and it's, you know, by the grace of God, I'm making it, and by hope, I'm making it. What we're seeing is that Americans who don't have that college degree, Americans in the working class, Americans in the lower middle class, Americans who are poor, are much more likely to experience family instability, they're less likely to get married, and they're less likely to stay married. I had to bring home a, what are those called? Pregnancy, Pregnancy test. test. Okay. Uh, and then she took it, and the next thing you know, I went outside, smoked cigarette, came back in, she says, I'm pregnant. Make you happy? Uh, We're not actually married, but we don't believe in a piece of paper saying we love each other, so, but we will eventually get married. Couples are typically romantically involved at the time of the birth of a child, but if there's no discussion about the impact of marriage on adults and children, usually within a year, the father is gone. We, I need my family. That's all I've ever wanted in my life was a family, just a, a baby to call me daddy. There's that big girl that's smiling. You will always find exceptions to the rule. It's just like smoking cigarettes. Just because you smoke does not mean 100% that you're going to get lung cancer. So there will always be exceptions to the rule. Can we find cohabiting couples that are doing just great and they've been together for 25 years? You bet. And can we find couples who are still married, whose relationship stinks? Yes. Just because there are exceptions out there that are working does not mean that's in the best interest of everybody. On average, kids who are born to married parents are much more likely to experience stability. Every marriage has its ups and downs. And when mom and dad can kind of figure out a way to keep things together, they benefit and their kids benefit. Another growing divide is between those who attend religious services and those who don't. The poor and working class are not attending the way they did a few decades ago, and that has consequences, especially for marriage. Faith was a huge part of our life. We're sinful people as it is. We can't afford to miss church. How you doing today, brother? Good, how you doing? I do believe in a higher power, but to say that it's a God, I don't know whether it is God. I was made to go to church when I was younger, so when I got of age to not go to church, I decided not to go. I stepped away from God. I stepped away from church. I stepped away from faith. I just kind of did whatever I felt like I wanted to do. I hadn't been active in church, but I've, I'm always thankful to God. Watch this week, and please make it a great day again tomorrow. Amen.
Our church has services every week, so we attend then, and we also do small group with um, a few people, a few different couples inside their home. But it really is that small group intimate interaction where we get to be real with one another that makes a difference. Kara and Montague are similar to Jason and Shannon. They have college degrees with good incomes. Both couples reap the benefits of church every week. Jason and Shannon even started teaching a marriage class at church. They also share their story on billboards and on faith websites like comeonletsgo.com. One conversation, one flirty word led to an affair. When I crunched the numbers, the biggest surprise to me as a scholar was seeing that high school educated Americans back in the 70s were more likely to attend church. The biggest drop in church attendance in recent decades has been among the poor and working class. Working class and poor Americans may feel like their lives are too messy in some cases. Churches and their religious institutions need to be more intentional about extending kind of a welcoming spirit to people who are dressed differently, to people who have non-traditional families of one sort or another. Being involved in your community is linked to more happiness. The upper class and college educated are twice as likely to volunteer regularly compared to everyone else. What else, what else to move out? I grew up in a family that really valued giving back to the community and being a part of the solution. And I think that we miss something when we don't live connected. We are expanding to create a place where the single moms on campus can have a place where they feel like they belong. All of us are basically grounded and guided um, by our social ties, by our social capital. Uh, we, we gain strength typically from our civic ties, and Americans who are connected are more likely to be flourishing. Couples like Kara and Montague have plenty of social capital. They are heavily involved in their community. Kara even started her own nonprofit called the Momentum Network. It serves as a resource and connection for single moms in college. Being in other people's lives just shifts your perspective to seeing that wow, like everybody is really working hard to live a happy life. In Reno, it was a nonprofit organization called Catholic Charities that helped Stephen find a new purpose and a new job. He works beside other volunteers from different backgrounds, all with a shared goal to be part of something bigger than themselves. We live in this world where you push a button and your garage door opens and you drive in and you close it and you're in your house. We can come alongside each other and make our lives a whole lot richer. Back in 1970, there were plenty of Americans who were a part of, you know, the VFW, who were part of the Shriners. There's been a precipitous decline in the number of Americans who are involved in informal groups. It's all about getting out of your silo, getting engaged in the community, and opening your eyes to the opportunities that are literally right around you. This is going to go above this. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. For most people, the secret to a happy life comes down to meaningful connections in four areas. Family, faith, work, and community involvement. But the less education a person has, or the less money they make, the more likely they are to be missing out on these. So when you hear about divorce rates going up, church attendance going down, those trends are true. But the trends are hitting the poor and working class much harder. And the divide is growing.
we gain strength typically from our family members, from our faith communities, uh, from our, our civic ties. And Americans who are connected to uh, families, who are connected to religious communities, who are connected to other secular forms of civic you know, groups, are more likely to be flourishing. Um, they're more likely to be happy. In some cases, they're more likely to be also flourishing financially. You've been slobbering for about three days on that shirt. I'm a simplistic man. I don't need much to be happy. I don't have to have all kinds of toys like everybody's got to have. It's something that's not important to me. I need my girls, and that's all I need. I don't need anything else. As long as I got her love and her love, life's good. I'm not really in pursuit of happiness anymore. And I think that's been my problem for 37 long years, is that I have been looking for happiness and it's temporary. I'm looking for joy now. <laughs> happiness to me is, is she's happy. That's my happiness. I'm gonna do whatever I can do to make her as happy as she can be, and then I'm happy. I wish you guys all the best. Keep us in your prayers, and we'll do the same for you. I hope that our story continues to spread throughout the world to give people hope, to say, if they can get through three affairs, we can get through one, but you can only get through it with God. You'll never get through it on your own. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to say Christians are better than somebody. That's not what we're saying. We all have junk. We all have garbage. The difference is I just know that I can't do it on my own. You have to keep practicing grace. In our challenges, we've grown. It does bring more joy into our lives and not just a superficial happy, but a deeper joy. Yeah.